I'm Bobby Wrinkle, Adult Programming Coordinator, and we want to welcome you to the 101 series. In tonight's program, you'll learn of some of the important things you can do to protect yourself from financial loss and identity theft. Wes Spencer is a nationally recognized information security professional and chief information security officer with Perch Security. Nick Johnson is the systems administrator for FNB Bank and is a certified information security manager and a certified information system security professional. <coughs> wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Let's welcome our guests, Wes Spencer and Nick Johnson, as they present Cybersecurity 101. Thank you guys for having us. So uh, my name is Wes Spencer, and I'm gonna do like the first little part. I'm sure you probably have burning questions you wanna ask, and so um, just for the, because this is gonna be recorded, they've asked if we do like the Q&A at the very end, so keep your questions in mind, write them down if you need to remember them, and we'd be um, glad to answer any questions you have. Um, so I, I'm Wes, you can just call me Wes, no need for misters or any of that business. Um, still too young for that. Um, my company, Perch, um, we're based out of Tampa, Florida and Houston, Texas, and I happen to live here. I work remotely, so I'm one of those people that work out of my home. Um, sometimes that can be a shock to people. It's actually a lot of fun. I don't have anywhere to drive unless it's to a coffee shop, and uh, most of my day is on the phone talking to people. So um, anyway, we, I'm not here to talk about my company, but to give you an idea of who we are, we're a security company. We're very new, about a year old. Um, we work with companies as small as very little health practices and, and credit unions all the way up to household names like Visa um, and Netflix. So we work with all kinds of different companies um, where I'm at. So um, I have been in the security world for a long time and I'm really passionate about it. I love talking about it. I love speaking about it to people of any audience um, and it's a lot of fun. So thank you for coming and um, really appreciate you guys being here. So. I like to start out, whenever I talk about security to anybody, whether they're really technical or really not technical, I always use this little slide right here. So when it comes to security, you've probably been in that boat where you see a picture like this and you say, oh, what a nice lighthouse, right? The, the, kind of the analogy is that that's nice looking. I wouldn't mind being there. It looks like a nice peaceful place I'd like to go, but we don't have the whole picture. When we see the whole picture, we realize, oh no, a storm is brewing, maybe I shouldn't be there. And I don't know if you've been in those shoes, I'm not gonna ask to raise hands, but if you've ever had identity theft in your life or some kind of scam or some kind of cybersecurity problem, this is how you feel. Everything seems okay until the day it hits and then you feel lost, you feel um, attacked, you feel like someone has stolen something from you. It is a horrible feeling. I have been in your shoes, it's happened to me too. It does not matter. Um, whether you're a security person like me or somebody that knows nothing about it, um, it can happen to all of us. And so we are definitely gonna be talking about that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit high level first, then Nick is gonna come, and Nick is gonna be talking about some real practical good stuff. I was looking at his material yesterday and I told him, I said, Nick, this is really good stuff. So um, definitely take notes if some of these things are um, of help to you. So when we think about like a lot of cyber crime, um, it's not just this day and age, you know, when you think about how it used to start and where we're at today, it's come to the point where everybody struggles. Has anybody seen something like this before? I'm sure some of you might know what you're looking at here. Does anyone know what this is? Yes, sir. Ransomware. That is ransomware, yes. So um, I, I play with ransomware sometimes at my own house just doing um, research and, and, and testing it with our systems. Um, this is really nasty stuff, so if you've never heard of this, um, this is software that gets installed. There's a, there's a few different ways that it can get on your computer, but what it does is it goes and it encrypts all of your files. It makes it to where you cannot see them. So your images, your Word documents, all of the things that are on your computer, it makes it to where you cannot see them. And then what they do is they say, you're gonna have to pay me money if you want me to unlock or unencrypt these files. That is not fun. I've dealt with multiple companies that have had this happen to them, and it is um, not fun. I know individuals. It's not just businesses that this happens to. It's even individuals as well. Uh, so this is kind of an illustration. Um, I don't remember if in the news you re recall this. This happened more in the UK than it did in the, the US, although it started to filter into the US. I will never forget this happening. So there was a ransomware outbreak that started in some hospitals within the UK. 
Um, this was eventually coined WannaCry. If you ever remember hearing on the news something called WannaCry, that is the, the name of this. Here's what happened. Some ransomware began to, to have an outbreak on some hospital systems and it spread like wildfire. Uh, and it began to infect multiple hospitals to the point to where their systems were completely shut down. And it was, a, I remember watching this as it was happening, see it happening on Twitter, kind of reading through the feeds, seeing the news cycles break out and all of this. It was a red alarm event. Um, a lot of the security groups that I'm in, people were talking about this. And even seeing some of the text messages and the tweets that were coming out about this, they were literally shutting hospitals down and saying, do not come to our hospital unless it is a life-threatening event. Otherwise, we cannot see you as a patient. Can you imagine that? that would be really, really, really bad. Um, and it happened, it happened in the UK and for, an, for at least a full day, uh, they were in major uh, meltdown mode. So this is where we're at today with cybercrime. It's a real shame that bad guys um, do the things that they do, um, but in a minute I'm gonna show you why they do the things that they do. Um, this is one of the, the, the hospital systems that got shut down from some ransomware, and you, you, you might be able to see it up here at the very top where it says, hey, we're currently experiencing significant problems with our IT and telephone network. That was the public message that they were giving. Uh, the private message was they were completely shut down from ransomware and trying to recover their systems. And remember, we're in an age today where everything is electronic. I'm a big fan of everything being electronic, but the risk to that, of course, is things like this can really shut us down. And, and that is a, a, a huge challenge for us. So, a little trivia question for you. Uh, I have two really notable things in this image. The first is a file cabinet, and to the right of that is a very small, I'll give you a hint, that's actually a, what we call a server, it's just a more powerful computer. But those two items right there are really, really historical, those two physical ones. Does anybody know what those two are? Let's start with the file cabinet. Does anyone remember what that file cabinet belongs to is a really famous news event that might have gotten a president fired. Yes, so the, that is the file cabinet from Watergate that you are looking at, the actual one. Does anybody know what that server is? Yes, ma'am, that is Hillary Clinton's private email server, the very one. So why do I show that? This is why I, this image is, is so telling, it really shows where we've gone from the 60s and 70s to mainly information threats being physical in nature, like you know, sort of the smash and grab, get in, grab the files and go, to being not different in the motive, but the means being totally different of bad guys saying, let me go after the digital footprint instead. And we all know to this day and age, to this very day, there has not been an end to the news cycles dealing with that server and all the things that have come out of it. So it really shows um, where our economy has shifted and where the world has shifted into digital threats. Uh, so one of the things that I like to do, um, I, I was a professor at Murray State for a number of years before I kind of switched hats and other jobs. And I did a lot of research in um, this world of cybercrime. And uh, I like to kind of uncover it. So occasionally you'll hear about this on a TV commercial about somebody saying, hey, we'll do a dark web scan for you. Or you hear it on like, you know, one of the, the, the TV, the crime TV shows and sort of this uh, era, like what is this all about? It sounds really scary. Um, and I like to kind of show this to people so you have an idea of what you're actually seeing. It's, it's a little different than what you might think. So these dark web sites are where the bad guys go to buy and sell their wares. And I talk about this a lot at presentations about how you sort of have this, um, what I call like a digital crime supply chain. So just like you think about a supply chain for automobiles, you've got people that supply the rubber for the tires, people that supply the metal for the chassis, the people that supply the paint for the, the, the paint of the car, all of these things, it's a whole supply chain to get the car out of the plant and into your hands. The world of cybercrime is the same way today. So you have people today that are very sophisticated at one certain thing, and they monetize that. Um, I know some FBI agents that have talked about this before and they say what will surprise you when we finally catch some of these people, especially the ones abroad, they're just doing this to buy bread for their family. It doesn't excuse what they do. It is still illegal and still morally and ethically wrong. However, it's interesting, he said, when you interview these people and they say, I was doing it to buy bread. I live in a country that is extremely closed off and this was the only way I could get ahead. And all of a sudden you realize, now I see why there's such motivation from these criminals. Because it may be their only way to do something. Again, no excuse for it. 
uh, but puts into perspective. So this is one of these sites. This one's called Alpha Bay. It's now been shut down by the federal government. Um, but this is one you could go to on the dark web, and they sold all sorts of things, from credit card numbers to actual uh, malicious software that you could use yourself to training guides, all kinds of things. Um, another example. So this was something called the Lizard Stressor, which is sort of a funny little hacker name. What this thing did was um, you could go to these people and you could pay them money, and then they would um, do what's called a denial of service attack on a website. In other words, they would shut it down. They would fill it with so much web traffic that you couldn't go to that website anymore. So imagine if you're a bank, right, and all of a sudden none of your customers can go to your bank website. That is significant. And today's day and era, era of everything being digital, that is really significant. For the low, low, low price of $20 a month, you too can shut websites down as large as some of the biggest ones you've heard of. PayPal is a good example of one that got shut down. So uh, it, it kind of shows you how they put this into the hands of the common person. It's not difficult to do this anymore because of the supply chain of people saying, we'll do this for you, we just want you to pay for it. Um, another example is some kind, sometimes software. So Nick in a minute is going to talk about how software should be patched, how you should go to your computer. If you have a Windows computer and there's Windows updates, you should definitely install those updates. Really important. Um, and I'll tell you why. If a bad guy finds a way to take advantage of that software and he's the very first or she is the very first one, they can sell it for a lot of money. So this um, is a, it doesn't matter which one it is, it's called MS-15034, it was a very important one that came out and there's a bad guy that figured out how to take advantage of this. He sold it on the dark web for 518 Bitcoin. So if you want to get an idea of what that, now this is what today's value, take 518 and, and multiply it by $8,000 each. Back then when this was sold, this was still close to a million dollars. So it shows you that there is a marketplace, that there is sophisticated cyber criminals with a lot of money at their hands that will pay a premium for things like this. Why is that? Because crime today, cyber crime today, is no longer just some guy in his basement doing something bad. In the 90s, that was, the true, that was true. Today, it is very sophisticated criminal groups that are doing this in mass. They know what they're doing, and there is a lot of money in this to go after individuals, to go after businesses, all sorts of scams. You probably hear them. You get a phone call, right, and it's somebody that says they're from the IRS. They're not from the IRS. Um, it is all part of a very sophisticated group of criminals. They know what they're doing, uh, and there's a lot of money that's in this. There's also training guides. So where a lot of people, I've heard interviews multiple times of people that have been arrested, that have done a lot of this stuff, um, kind of on the, the dark side of things, and people ask them, how did you find out about all of this? And they say, honestly, I buy guides and I read. And it's, they spend a lot of time in the evenings and they read up on these things. There are guides, there is education out there for other people to learn these skill sets and figure out how to do these things. So this is one right here. Someone is selling what's called point of sale hacking. So this is where a lot of times you wonder, like, how did my credit card get stolen from somebody? One way, it's not the only way, but one way it happens is you swipe your card at some restaurant and there is malicious software running on that machine and it siphons and steals it and sends it to the bad guy. That is the most common way it happens. Um, you can ask any bank. That is a very frustrating part of their job. It wasn't the bank that lost your credit card numbers. It was sometimes you just use the card and it, it, that's what happens in this digital world, right? So this is an example of somebody showing others you can buy his guide and learn how to do it. Um, this one was called Tox. This was developed by a high schooler, believe it or not. And this was an idea. The kid said, I just had an idea. He said, this whole ransomware thing was interesting, and I kind of wrote my own ransomware. And he thought, you know, I wonder if I could create my own website on the dark web and just make it to where you can, you can email me a couple things through here, you can send me some data, and then I will give you the ransomware. And then all you have to do, you don't have to write it, you just take that ransomware and send it to people you know, and it infects their computers. And then what he says is, when they pay me, I will give you a cut out of it. That's what he did. And so we call that ransomware as a service. So you do not have to be somebody very skilled anymore. You just have to know how to get to one of these websites, and then you download it and you send it to people you know. It is a really terrible thing. So this kid said, I just developed it because he's a smart high school curious kid. And guess what happened? He realized it took off like wildfire and he shut it down because he realized, whoa, I just my curiosity got the better of me. Unfortunately, there are many other people that now do this. And so you can pay them money and they will give you the malicious software. You don't have to know how to write it anymore. Um, pretty scary. 
So I talk about this a lot when I speak um, uh, to other people, especially like uh, technical people. Why are we failing? Why are we struggling with this? Why, do you, why am I talking in this room being filled out with, with, with people wanting to know why is this happening? This wasn't happening 20 years ago. Nobody cared about cybersecurity 20 years ago. Now we fill rooms with this. Why is that? So there's a lot of reasons that I think this is happening. Um, just some, some facts for us that I think illustrate where we are at. So bad guys, this kind of is a graphic and it's probably hard to see the numbers on this screen and that's okay. Um, but what we're seeing here, so there's multiple uh, research companies that keep track of like malicious software. Over the years, on the very far left is 2008, the very uh, newest is 2017. What we're seeing here in the red is how many different versions of malicious software have been written. Look at this amp up. The reason it's amped up is because more and more criminal groups are getting involved in this and they are finding more and more creative ways to write this stuff in mass. It's no longer just one person writing one piece of bad code and trying to get it out there. You've got teams of people. We're writing software that automates itself and does things all by its own to change and morph and it makes it really difficult for the researchers and the good guys to stay up. In fact, one website says there are 390,000 new malicious samples of like bad software and yucky stuff out there that come out every single day. That is a very, very fast pace that I think we struggle with. So it's hard. I'm going to actually skip over a couple of these things. So this is actually a little bit better. So there's another website that likes to, to track um, the number of, of data records that have been stolen, and this is constantly kind of a ticker. So that number at the top is there's a lot of commas there. <laughs> So let's simplify this down into something that means more to us. Every 53 seconds on average, a record is stolen somewhere in the world. Some kind of personal record, whether it's your credit card, whether it's your bank information, whether it's your login to an email or Netflix or something you use um, or your bank account. So that kind of puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Every 53 seconds, it shows you the plethora of records that are constantly being stolen. I never see a week that goes by where there's not some new data breach of some kind. The only question is how big um, will it be? So we are really, really far behind. So what does this lead to? Uh, one of the things I think this leads to, this is, a, this is one small example. I put one of these like little word mashups together of a whole bunch of breaches that have happened over the past few years. Um, you know what this leads to, unfortunately, is something I call breach fatigue. Here's what I mean by this. Oh, and other breaches in the news. Oh well, nothing new. News cycle forgets about it tomorrow and we move on. Except when it affects you. Then it's always different, always different. And that is the frustration that I think we have today is that as, a, as a, like even as the American economy, we get really unhappy about this for a few minutes while we read the article and then we move on unless it happens to us. That's where we're at. Um, because these bad guys are so, so good at it. But I tell people all the time, it should matter. If you are a company, whether you are a very small company or a very large company, it should matter to you. Look at the research that's been done. So a few things here. 75% of customers, if something happens to them, they will finally update their antivirus. <laughs> they will finally say, okay, it's, something happened to me. I'm finally going to take the time to click that button and wait for the 10 minutes for this thing to do its thing. I, I am staggered that number's not higher, um, but that's what Experian found in, in the research. This is even better. 50% of customers will finally re review their online data activity. So this might be difficult for some people, but more and more websites are finally starting to have a security page that you can go to. For example, if you use Gmail or you use um, like one of the Microsoft emails, like Hotmail, something like that, they actually have a security page now that you can go to. And you can click on that security page and it walks you through an online um, kind of process to go through and it lets you see, hey, here are the places that somebody has logged into your email from. And you can look at that and say, oh, they're all from Benton, Kentucky. They're all from Marshall. That, that's good. They're all from Paducah. That's good. That's definitely me. You might see one in there from Shanghai. That's not good. Definitely not good. So you can do that. Go to your email, log into your email, and there is a security page. Usually it's in your settings, and you should be able to find that, and it will walk you through those things. Really valuable to take 10 minutes, and it'll guide you through the process of how to go through some of those checks. So that is something people finally do, but a lot of times it takes a breach of some kind for them to do it. 64% um, of customers will end their customer relationship with somebody who had a breach. Banks know this. 
So a bank will tell you that's their biggest fear because if a bank has some kind of breach and your data is stolen from that bank, how many people are confident they want to bank there? Nobody does, right? Um, other companies are learning the same thing. So you're finally starting to see customer action of saying enough is enough when it happens to me personally. And I think that's a good thing because I think it holds us responsible. Um, a lot of, so IBM did a study a while back and they found that every time a record is stolen, it costs that company on average $221. That doesn't sound significant until you think that a lot of breaches are 10,000 to millions of records. Now you do the math and you say, whoa, this is really, really, um, this costs a lot. Now why is it so expensive for my you know, login to some website? Why does that cost me so much per record? Well, there's a lot of reasons. It takes legal, so you've got to pay lawyers to come in and handle this. Um, you've got to usually pay for credit monitoring. That's very expensive for each person. There's a lot of costs that go into that. And so that's where that, that record, on average, $221 per record. That's the cost. So when I talk to companies, I tell them, hey, this is a way you can do your math. Take your entire record base. How many records do I have in my company that are, that are, court, that are confidential information from my customers and run the math? Just multiply by 221, gives you a good ballpark. And then sometimes people's mouth drop open like, that's $30 million for me. I'm like, yeah, that's why this is important. Imagine if that got stolen by a bad guy. That's why it's important. So I think it personally, I think it's important to put dollar figures to things. It helps us understand. Um, I'm gonna skip by a couple things. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nick really quick. And um, Nick is gonna talk about some really practical things. And then we have some um, Q&A. We've already actually got a few questions already written up for us on here that we'll talk about. Um, and if you have other questions, um, we would love to know. So Nick, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you run. Thank you. Well, um, I hope Wes has not sufficiently tried to scare you out of the room <laughs> or anything like that. Um, he talks about some really cool stuff. He talks about some really high level things. Um, and what I want to talk about is an action plan that will help you out in your, that anybody can do. Um, just eight simple wins here. And, uh, and you may be doing some of these. These might be, uh, I've talked to a couple people before the uh, presentation started and uh, some people are already doing some of these. So that's really good. Um, the idea would be to get everybody else on board with it, to get everybody doing a lot more stuff. And um, there's eight simple things here, but there's a ninth one at the end I want to cover, and uh, it's an all-encompassing thing. So let's jump right in. First thing, Wes mentioned it about patches. Everybody should be familiar with this, I hope. Uh, Windows 7 patch management here, Windows updates, uh, you got to be doing them. This is how a lot of your stuff happens. I mean, if not a lot, it's the most. I mean, it's, it's really critical. Now, a lot of people don't like to do this because, well, their computer has to reboot. It slows their computer down while it's doing it. But technology's advanced, and we can make this a lot more convenient for you. Uh, when you check out Windows 10, this is a Windows 10 type screen here, you can schedule these updates. They can happen at night, at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're in bed asleep. You don't know anything. And when you wake up in the morning, your computer's updated, secured, you know, good to go. So I hear excuses from a lot of people on doing these updates. This to me leaves no excuse. You know, it's, it's something simple that you can set up. Uh, you can Google for it, how to do it. It's in your settings. Uh, this is stuff right here that's what I call step one. And the reason it's step one is, like Wes talked about, it's, it's how a lot of these breaches happen. New software comes out, the malware comes out, these viruses come out, and you gotta be patching your system. So, in my opinion, number one, that's why it's number one. Schedule them overnight if you have to. And this doesn't just apply to Windows. There's other applications that this works with. So your Microsoft Office, your Adobe Reader, Java, I mean, everybody all uses these like third-party programs. Uh, it's not just your Windows. Uh, your browser. Um, not a lot of people use Internet Explorer anymore, I mean, that I see. A lot of people still use it, I guess, but Chrome, from Google, Firefox, all these third parties, you got to be checking those as well. And uh, that's, how, that's how you stay secure. Just shore up all your defenses. Antivirus. This is the moat around your castle. So a lot of things come in and 
um, as Wes was talking about, you have software that comes out, and they have these things called zero days because Microsoft doesn't know about it to issue a patch yet. So it comes out. Modern antivirus has behavioral in it. So it says, I don't know the DNA of that virus, but I know how a virus acts. So when it starts acting up, when it starts doing things out of sorts, I'm going to quarantine it just to be safe. Rule number one also applies to antivirus. You've got to keep it updated. If your antivirus is sitting on uh, updates and definitions from 2010, what good is it doing you in 2018? Not much. So, and there's free ones out there. A lot of people think you've got to go to Walmart, Best Buy, uh, buy $50, $80 worth of antivirus every single year. There's some really good free stuff out there. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you a free one here in a second, some additional features it has that a lot of people don't know that you can get out of free antivirus. But whatever you get, install it, keep it updated, and, and get involved. Look at the settings in it. Sometimes it slows your computer down. There's some things you can do to help it out. So keep your antivirus updated. And the last part of that, automatic scans. Again, you can schedule these at night while you're in bed asleep. There's no reason not to run it at that point. It'll run complete at night. So I'm going to show you the next slide here. It goes in, and this is a free antivirus. I use this at home on my personal laptop. And it has an additional web component to it that if I want, I can go into each one of these settings and I can say, well, warn me about this, or just go ahead and outright block that. I don't have to... And if you have kids or grandkids uh, and you have a laptop at your house, this is a really good way of keeping them maybe off of certain sites and certain things that you don't want them to get into. And that's all built in. And that's a free antivirus. You go to the site, give them an email address, you log in, you download it, you run it, and you can configure all this, you know, choose what you want and what you don't want. So there's some really sophisticated things out there as far as antivirus goes. Again, no reason not to run it, but you do see people that don't run it. So we go into safe passwords. This gets a little bit more complicated and a real sore spot for a lot of people. Um, you have passwords for everything. You got passwords for 15 different sites, your online banking, your email, your Facebook. You got a passcode on your phone, I hope, you know. Um, so how do you remember them all, you know? And then, uh, honestly, I don't, it, what, does, any, does anybody want to guess what the most popular password is? Is that even up there on my, on my slide? But uh, does anybody want to know what the most popular password is? One, two, three, four. Yeah. Password. Password. Oh, okay. password, one, two, three, one, 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 two, three, four, five, six. Um, and, and hackers have these lists. They know it. So if they want to compromise your account, what's the first thing they're going to try? Well, I know it's, you know, John Doe at email.com, and I pop that address in, and, well, I'm going to try a password. And I'm going to try 1111 because there's a good chance I'm going to get in on that. So what you want to do is obviously you want to use something a little bit different, and you don't want to use a three-character password because that's easily guessable by other computers. Computers can guess a lot faster then guess a lot more permutations of that password. So you want a long password. Now, up there it says 14 characters, right? That's a long password. I kid you not. That's a long password. So you got to have little tricks. Um, if you do the, like, change this uh, 3 to a, you know, an E, change that B to an 8, well, you end up with this complex password that you sit there and try to remember what it was what did I put in place for those letters and numbers and swap around back and forth? And you can't remember it. You lock yourself out, and when you lock yourself out, you reset your own password, and you're just, I'm done with this complex thing. I can't do it. I can't keep up with 15 different versions of it for all my sites. I'm just going to set my password as password. And there's ways around that. And the top one we talk about is, and we use this, I, I, we preach this at the, at the bank all the time, and that's, Phrases, password phrases. Uh, you don't have to think about it. 
song lyrics. Mary had a little lamb. You know, you can use any, what's your favorite song? Type that out, whatever the chorus is. You know, I, uh, I was fixing a, uh, here's a good example, I was fixing a, uh, a teller's computer. I had to remote into their computer. And uh, it shocked me. She, she started typing, and it was just, she just kept typing her password to log in, kept typing her password to log in. And I'm like, are you, are you, are you paying attention? Like, I thought she was looking away while she was typing and didn't know that she was still typing her password. She probably had 27, 30 characters in her password. And this is a, a teller on a drive through So uh, it works, you know. But she was using something, I think it was like song lyrics. But it helped her remember. And that's a complex password. That's a password that will never be guessed by a human or a powerful computer out there using different permutations. Um, you can use word associations. So you look at tonight, what is it? It's, you know, library presentation. That's a long password. That's a secure password there. Add some letters and numbers on the end of it maybe to make it even more complex for a computer to guess. It's a real easy way to do it. And then we get into usage. Where do you use your passwords? You should be using them on everything. Your laptop at home should have one. Your computer at home should have one. Um, pretty much everybody these days has a smartphone. Uh, there's still some flip phones out there, but even those have pin codes that you can get into. Now, I don't say use a 14-character pin code to get in your phone. That's going to be a nightmare. But there's ways to get into a phone <clears throat> through a uh, patterns. You've got numbers that you can type in. Uh, some smartphones now, you can do the fingerprint. And um, iPhones now and everything, you've got facial recognition that it does. There's no reason to leave your cell phone just laying around where anybody can pick it up and log right in. You can get on all your accounts, make calls. There's no reason not to use one. So we get down to this last bullet point down here. And this is uh, something that's, that's not used a lot uh, that I see. Uh, it's, it's something that's really cool. Uh, I recommend it. I use it myself because as an IT guy, I have tons of IT resources that I use. And I can't keep track of all the passwords all the time because I have to use different ones. So I use a service myself called LastPass. You can sign up for it. And when you go to, say, Facebook and you log in, you have it installed. It's a little add-on to your browser. So if you use Chrome, you'll see it in the corner up there. And you have one main account for it. It's a very, I would make that a really secure password. That's your, that's your skeleton key that gets you into everything else that you're going to add to it. Make a complex password for that. Then you go to Facebook, you log in. It'll say, hey, I saw you log into something. Would you like me to save that password for you? And where it saves it is a very secure lockbox, so to speak. Well, next time you go to Facebook and it asks you to want to log in, it'll pop up and say, I see a login. Last time you were here, you used this. Would you like to use it again? Yeah, I sure would. Boom, logs you right in. You don't have to worry about it, you know. And it's things like that that keeps you from writing your passwords down on a password list that somebody's going to come across one day or using simple passwords or having to reset your password all the time and you get frustrated and set it back to, you know, one, two, three, four all the time. Um, simple steps that everybody can take. And this, I, let's see here, what we got next? I think I got some other password stuff here. I love this. I, I found this a while back. Um, it's a site called HaveIBeenPwned.com. And what this site does, you go there, you can punch in your email address, and it'll tell you, hey, your, your email has not been owned. Somebody has not got your credentials because you use that email at LinkedIn or Facebook. Well, Facebook and LinkedIn get hacked. You didn't do anything wrong, but they leaked your information out. So you might want to go and check that and change that password for that site. Okay? And then here's what it looks like if you type it in and you do have a breach. Pops up, says, here's where you got breached. Here's what the hack was. So gives you a little description on it, where it was at, what was actually compromised. And that's a real good way to kind of do a simple check. You know, how secure am I? What's my, what's my security hygiene like? I'm sorry, I didn't catch much of that. What has he been 
It's right at the top up there. It's on. It's it's a website. Yep. So we go on to number four. We're halfway through here. Or eight. Um, keep all systems regular backed up. And this is one thing that when I in early in my IT career, and I've been doing this for gosh ten years now. Um, you see it with the, a lot of home users, and they always have files. They're, they're pictures of their family, pictures of their grandkids. They got tax forms. Um, they've got valuable information stored on their computer. Next thing you know, their computer's got a virus, like the ransomware that Wes was talking about. Um, well, if you have a backup, you don't have to really worry about it. The backup solution, well, your computer crashed, or my computer's got ransomware. Okay, that's, that's not good. But I've got a backup, so I've still got my data. My data is still secure, my information. We all need to be doing a backup. And again, I'm try we go into this no excuse thing. There's a little always, always effort involved. You gotta have to do a little extra, but it's so much worth it. Nobody thinks that they need a backup until they really need it. And when I, a long time ago, I used to work at Best Buy. The people that come in that bought external hard drives for their computer were really been out of shape because they lost their data. Their computer crashed or it got hacked or they lost it in a house fire even or something. It's, it was always something. And very rarely did somebody just come in and buy one because they thought they should have one ahead of time. It was somebody coming in to clean up a mess and to fix it going forward. Let's get ahead of it now. Now, there are services out there. The cloud, we heard that phrase, the cloud, everything's in the cloud these days. There are services in the cloud. So if you have a Gmail address or you have a Hotmail address or these come with services for cloud storage. Now, you can pay more money. These are, I think they give out 25 gigs for free, which is quite a bit of you know of space to store things, but you can buy even more if you wanted it. And it's the cloud, so there's there's pretty much a limited amount of space that you can get up there. But these services can have apps that run on your computer, and what they'll do is they'll say, "I want to look at my pictures, my documents, my videos, uh, these folders on my computer, and I want you to sync them." synchronize what's on my computer to what's in the cloud. So if you had a house fire, God forbid, and you lost your, your computer, well that's okay, because your stuff is sitting in a data center somewhere in California. So when you get another computer, or if you go to a different computer, you log into OneDrive or you log into Google Drive, all your stuff is there. It's not on your computer, and it's kept behind, again, a well-protected account with a nice password that's 14 or more characters. So again, there's not a lot of excuse for this. There's all kinds of resources out there that you don't have to go and pay out of pocket on. Number five, keep up your guard against all email. So fishing, right? I love to fish. Uh, crappie, bass. Uh, crappie's pretty good. Right now, bass will be coming up in a little bit, but that's not this. That's that's a whole other kind of fishing. Um, that's a fun type of fishing. These this fishing is not so much fun, um, especially if you get hooked, right? Um, I know that's an email there, and this is the time of year where you're going to start seeing things come in from the IRS. IRS, right? When you look at this email, does the IRS email you from? Well, what is that, irxt.com, you know? These are red flags, and I'm gonna show you some red flags to look for from emails. But when you get these emails that come in, they will do their darndest to look legit, very legit. And you gotta, you gotta keep an eye on all this stuff. You gotta look for these red flags. Um, I mean, does the IRS, I mean, unless you have something going, does the IRS really reach out and contact you a lot? My experience is not really, you know, it's, it's scammers. So uh, in the past everybody was really focused on getting scam phone calls. We are going to talk about those. But nowadays they can do this automated. Bots as they say. Server farms. 
they blast this stuff out by the millions. And it's a shotgun effect, right? They're going to blast it out. They only need a few people to reply to make some money. So there's no effort on their part. And that's fishing. So you want to keep an eye on your fishing. You want to make sure that when you get these emails, and they may look like this from Amazon, right? And you see some things that are pointed out up here, okay? And some notes out to the side. That's not an Amazon address, you know? That's, that's, you can see the dear client on there. Uh, you're at, you have a name on Amazon. If they contact you, it'll say Bill, Bob, Sally, Sue. It'll say it. Generic greetings, that, you know, they don't have to type nothing in there. That's, that's something, again, doesn't require work on their part. And then links. They can make that link look like anything. That link could say, official Amazon, official FNB bank. Go here, click this. Doesn't matter. It's the information behind that link. What's the code in the email? So you hover your mouse over the link. You see down there, it takes you to some kind of redirect something.com, right? Don't ever click on that link. Don't click it. But if you hover your mouse over that link, it will pop up and tell you what's really behind this link. What's the code? Where is it really going to take you? And you can look at it. If you get an email from Amazon and it's taking you to uh, redirect.caricascheduler.com, you know, probably not that legit, right? And that takes a fraction of a second to really check out. And what could that fraction of a second, so yeah, you're spending a fraction of a second to check it out, but what's it going to save you? Potentially your information, having to call credit bureaus and change your credit cards up and go through headache months on end because your identity got stolen because you clicked on a link. And you could have just solved it by hovering the mouse over it. So, phishing, big time stuff. It's, some, it's one of the biggest things at FNB when we do our security awareness training for our employees and everybody goes through it from teller to the bank president. Even our board of directors gets some security training. Phishing is all, it's, that's one of the hugest things we worry about. By, I mean, it might be the most, I would think, but uh, very serious stuff. Number six, online shopping, banking online. Um, getting more popular, right? There's a lot of people who won't go to the banking website. They want to come into a branch. That's okay. Uh, FNB talks about it where we say we want to cater to the, the people that want to use online banking, but if you want to come in to do your business, that's okay too. We welcome you in and we'll, we'll help you out any way you need. But for the people that go out online to do their banking or to Amazon, there's things you can do. When you go to the site, you want to look for that little S up there. It stands, basically, it might as well stay, it's secure, right? <clears throat> HTTPS, you want to look for that. You want to look for that little padlock. And I'm going to show you on the next slide a real website. It's our website. So what to look for. Um, some other aspects of this is uh, open Wi-Fi connections, okay? Um, you want to make sure that you're secure. Uh, I personally don't do my banking if, you know, I don't go to uh, coffee shops and uh, those who have the advantage of working at a coffee shops. Um, but I don't go there and I don't do my online banking. I don't check my accounts or anything like that because I don't know if there's a weirdo sitting over there sniffing the air to see what's happening. And next thing you know, they've got my info. So I don't do it on open Wi-Fi. I do it at my house where I have Wi-Fi. Um, I do it at work because I control the Wi-Fi. But when I go to a public place, I don't personally get on the Wi-Fi to do it. Um, another big one is when we talk about security awareness and getting fished, banks are not going to ask you for your password. I see this quite a lot. That people, you know, they give up their passwords. Well, they said they were the bank. They said they were the police. It's not true. Um, generally speaking, if the bank wants to get in your online banking, we'll go and reset your password. Because when you forget your password, uh, there's, method, there's methods that we have that reset your password, so, you know. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to the end of this presentation and there'll be, a, like I said, an overarching thought process I want you to go through on it. And then last bullet point talks about these, the passwords, and we talked about that, unique, strong passwords. This is uh, what you should look, this is a real example using my Google Chrome. 
If you look in the very top left, you see that padlock from that slide. Very top left up there is that padlock. If you go a little bit further over, you see the HTTPS. The S is there. We know it's secure. We know it's rock solid. We can use this website. It's good to go. Um, if you look over a little bit more, you see those th that yellow kind of gold square with the three dots in it? That's my last pass. That's what I was talking about where you can get one of these free password repositories. They'll help you remember all your passwords going forward. I use it. Seven, scams. Oh man, scams. Um, fake emergencies. And, and what you're going to get with scammers, they want you to act first and then think about it later. You know, leap before you look. That's what they're almost all designed to do, or intimidate. So if you're being pressured, if you're being intimidated, rushed, confused, these are most likely scammers. So red flags, like we looked at the Amazon email. That's, there's red flags all over it. There's red flags you can have in these conversations with people. Uh, fake emergencies, I gotta have this money, oh you don't understand. Uh, false promises, fabricated prizes. I'll guarantee if you go on the internet, and it pops up and starts flashing, you really did not win the free iPod on the internet, okay? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put good money on that. Um, uh, what are we getting here? Quid pro quo. So, you may speak Latin. Um, something for something, okay? Uh, you give, no, I'll give you this, you give me that. So, uh, a scam that went around a few years ago was, uh, you get into Windows XP becoming end of life. There's a lot of scammers that went around. They called people up at random and said, I'm from Microsoft. I promise, I'm from Microsoft. I am here to make sure your computer's ready for the Windows XP end of life. So if you will go to this website, allow me to log into your computer, I'll check it out for you free of charge. Right? They're going to check it out for you free of charge. That's the something on their end. The something they get, once they get in your computer, they drop viruses, malware, key loggers. They can track all your information once they're in there. So that's the quid pro quo, the something for something. You know, hey, they're giving me something. I'm getting free service out of this. Yeah, they're probably getting something too. Advanced fee scams. So you get in the top right. Has anybody ever heard that before? That the, uh, the Nigerian prince is what they always called it. And, um, it's not real. It's never happened. It's not out there. Uh, and we talked about the bottom here. This uh, IRS has a warrant out. Intimidation. I'm trying to scare you. Ooh, I don't want to go to jail. Who does? Right? But you got to think. Why would the IRS say if you'll pay this money over the phone? I mean, they're just not going to do it. So we get into this scams, they still happen over the phone. You can get these in email format where they come and they, they directly target you. It's more of like a, we talked about phishing where they kind of just broadcast it out to everybody. You can get a spear fish. They're going to target you specifically for something. And they'll say these things. They may know your name, you know. So we'll get to it here in a minute, but there's a thought process we're going to go through. And Wes asked about, he said, you know, there's been people in here probably who've been scammed. They know somebody who's been scammed or have had their identity stolen. Maybe they didn't do anything wrong, but just, hey, Equifax, I, they, I signed up for a credit card nine and a half years ago. Equifax ran my credit. Equifax gets hacked. Well, now they've got my information, my identity's out there. I hope everybody's done their taxes, by the way. Uh, so... When it happens, what do you do? Have an action plan, okay? We were all taught, you know, the house is on fire, what do you do? You know, you get out, you have a meeting place that you go to. Um, well, this day and age, scam victim, <laughs> excuse me, scam victim action plans, very valuable to have, very valuable. What do you do? A lot of people don't know who to call. Who should they reach out to? What do I do? Am I just, is my stuff just out there? Do I call the bank? Do I call you know, uh, Best Buy, do I call the police, FBI, what do I do? You go through these 
processes here. Now, number one is the most important. Stay calm. Keep your thoughts, keep your wits about you because this is the time to take in information. This is the time to see what's going on. Okay? Change your passwords. We talked about that. Having secure passwords, checking those out. Change them all immediately. List of information that was stolen. Okay? Hey, they got my account over here, they got my account over here, and they've been trying to get into this account. So make a list of all that. Your communications are vital. If somebody's been calling you, what time did they call you? What phone? Did you get emails? Save those emails. All this is going to be vital to an investigation to help you out. Credit reports, you got to get one because they're going to use your credit. They're going to run your credit up. Financial institutions, call us at FNB and let us know. We can, we can do all kinds of stuff for your account to help you out, but you got to call us about it. Let us know. Credit card companies the same way. If you get your credit card through us, whatever, you know, it's, but start calling people. And then contact law enforcement. Let them know your identity is stolen. You know, ask them what to do. They may have specific actions that they want you to take, but contact them as well. Have a plan. Now, I would always start local because okay. they may have a plan for you before you go to, you know, FBI or something. But contact your local people first. So, we get down to this next part, and this is where I really want. Well, first of all, I guess we're going to recap everything. My bad. So. We're going to patch systems, antivirus, safe passwords, update your systems um, with backups, sorry, phishing emails, online shopping and banking, look for that S, padlock, be aware of scams, action plan, okay? I see somebody taking a picture, so I'm going to wait for I advance. <laughs> All right, this is, I love this slide, so simple. Be security aware. Always be thinking. We talked about how scammers, they want you to, whether they're phishing, whether they're spear phishing, whether they're calling you on the phone, stop you on the street, they want you to leap before you look. Don't do that. Always be thinking. Be security aware. Have a security mindset from here on out. Wes talked about the changing world that we live in. It's only getting worse. So you've got to change your mindset. <coughs> It's just the world we live in. I wish it wasn't, but it is. So let's all change our mindset. Common sense. Look before you leap. That's what I ask of you. So, I want to thank you for coming out tonight, hearing what we have to say. Hopefully we gave you some good advice. Hopefully you'll take that good advice and put it to use. Um, hopefully we didn't scare you too bad, Wes. Uh, but the threat's out there, and the threat's real. Take some simple steps. Find out what you can do for yourself. Don't rely on some other large company to take care of you. We do our best at FNB. We really do. Part of that is, hey, we're coming out here tonight to talk to you, to engage with you, find out what we can do. But be security aware. Thank you.